Right, so the next speaker is Dr. John Ellis, and uh, he's going to talk about fundamental and applied surface nanoscience and tell us about all the wonderful things in their group. Yes. Okay, so first of all, thank you very much to the organisers for having us present this. Um, the, okay, so basically the, the talk is divided into three parts. I'm going to spend most of the parts time on part one, and if there's time, I'll say something on parts two and three. But the first thing I'd like to talk about is um, the work on surface dynamics we've been doing using the spin echo techniques. Now, supposing you could actually watch atoms move. You could just take a video of the atoms as they moved, as they were actually doing it. And to be honest, this is one of the holy grails, really, of science to be able to do just this. Um, and indeed, if you think about it, the one reason why people do so much computational work on potentials and reactions and things like this is to calculate this, because it's taken as red, you cannot see it. And so a huge computational effort goes into solving these problems, because it's taken the red, you cannot see it. Well, supposing you could see it, after you picked yourself off the floor in amazement of what you'd seen, what would you do? Well, what you actually need is to work out average properties, average jump lengths, how long it spends in the transition state, how fast it moves in the transition state, what the vibrational frequency is. You go for average properties, correlation, functions, etc., etc. Now, unfortunately, we can't get that video, but what we do is measure all those correlation functions you derive from it. And um, the... Okay, so we use... Um, sorry, I haven't got the hang of this thing. Sorry. Is there a better one of these that actually works? Because it's... <laughs> Okay, it does, it's got a rather latency, hasn't it? Okay, so actually we measure, the, we, we measure these correlation functions on this time scale, and uh, as it happens, we actually measure their Fourier transforms, which means there's a fair degree of data reduction to get back to it. But what it means then is we do see all of this, and we can measure all these features and um, work out really what's going on, which is quite good fun. Now, if you've got um, this... Uh, how many times do you have to press it? There we go, right? Okay, why would this be useful? What would you get out of this? Well, the point is, is that... Um, this is rather good fun, isn't it? Am I standing in the wrong place, do you think? Right, okay. So, if, what would, why would this be useful? Well, basically, if you can watch something move, then anything which can deflect that motion, you can measure. And the point is, if an atom's moving with thermal velocity, it requires very small forces to move it and change its motion. Therefore, you're sensitive to a vast range of things which can actually change that motion. So, for example, this lot. Obviously, energy barriers. You can test rate theory. Um, you can look at correlated motion between atoms on the atomic scale. And then you can look at larger scale things like how films grow, etc., etc. Um, and you can look at electronic and phonic friction. You can measure the friction on an individual molecule as it moves and all this sort of stuff. Now, of course, it has a huge range of applications because basically atomic motion underlies pretty much every process and specifically many processes like the chemical industry, the electronics industry and nanotechnology are done on surfaces. So this underlies and produces the science of the motion that lies behind that lot. So it's very widely applicable already. Now, okay, so how does the spin echo spectrometer work? Well, we work with helium-3. Uh, because it has a nuclear spin. If you're doing this in the bulk, they do it with neutrons. But we use helium-3, um, we polarise it in the beam, and then we shove it into a um, solenoid, uh, which then splits the wave packet. So one is sucked in, one's repelled. The one that's sucked in hits the sample first, and then you recombine them and you measure the polarisation at a detector. And the point is that this at this point here, the two wave packets, or the wave packet which has been split, the one particle has been split into two wave packets, that one hits the surface before the other, and so if anything changes on the surface in that time, you can measure the correlations of the motion, and that's the trick. And then what you do is you change the distance between these two wave packets to change the correlation time that you're looking at, and you change the angle of the crystal to get the Fourier transform of the spatial stuff. So that's basically how the experiment works. Now, um, Let's just want to focus for a couple of minutes on one particular type of motion, that's hydrogen diffusion. Um, an activated process, if you plot on a log plot of the rate against one upon t, you get a nice straight line, that's the activation energy, and if you've got tunnelling, it will level off, which is what we're seeing here. Now, obviously, the point of doing these measurements is to test some theory and develop theories which can predict how these things go, 
um, simple starting position is transition state theory. And the point is, this is given by thermodynamics, and you look at the number in this uh, state and use that to work out a rate, which, if I can get this thing to work, um, the rate depends on the density of states and how fast they're moving here. Now, let's then look at how this matches up with reality. Now, the first thing result you get out of all these measurements is it's stunning how good classical mechanics is describing atomic motion. We measure lots of things, and by and large, you can use classical mechanics to describe it, which is stunning because the wavelength of these things is about half an angstrom. You're just on the limit, and by and large, you can get away with it. And this is good news because there are millions of people out there who do molecular dynamics and assume this is the case. If you go and look, you find actually it is justifiable by and large, but not always. And sometimes, if you look, for example, at the light molecules like methane and carbon monoxide in this transition state when they're moving at a fair speed, you see a large quantum effect. They're moving much more slowly than you expect. And this is the quantum mechanics has kicked in. So just as for an electron in a solid, you can work out the band structure for a, high, a, a particle moving in a periodic potential. And what's happening here, you see, the theory has assumed classical states. So this is just kinetic energy is half mv squared. But what we have is the quantum states, of course, have a bandwidth, and the group velocity is given by the bandwidth. This is an actual calculation for hydrogen. And you find, you see, the bands are much narrower. The group velocities are much lower than the classical ones, so it moves much more slowly. So that's quite good fun. Now, if you then, another point about this is, of course, if you've got something like hydrogen, then these states, which are below the barrier, can propagate. So you have tunneling from the ground state, or more likely, from the excited states. And this is what we're seeing here. The dashed line is what the energetics would be, the Arrhenius plot would be, if you had to go over the barrier. This is tunneling through the top of the barrier, so it comes out with a smaller value. And this then, the solid lines are what you get if you can't predict the rate from this. Um, and that's the measurements, and there are no adjustable parameters in this. And this is unheard of in the field of diffusion and of any nature, let alone hydrogen, that you can hit it within a factor of two so precisely. So the basic idea is clearly working. This shows what happens if you don't do that. The, this is our data. This is a collaborator's fit. Zillions of hours of uh, path integral molecular dynamics calculations all ruined because this sort of feature wasn't stuck in at the end, which is rather sad. But this is the state of the art. Um, the collaborator, when we said, why didn't you put these effects in, he said, you can't possibly do that because it's not what anybody does. And the result is something which is in rather sad agreement, whereas this is a relatively quick calculation. OK, um, that, that, that effect is also seen in plasma. This all breaks down, however, when you get to deep tunneling. And the point is, this is assumed that there's no heat transfer with the substrate. When you're deep tunneling, it's slow, and so there's time for the energy exchanges to kick in. And what you find is that you actually measure things diffusing much faster than you'd expect from the deep tunneling. Now, this is completely the wrong way around. Because basically, if you have a ballistic motion, you go fast. If you introduce friction, it does random walk, so it goes more slowly. What we're actually finding is when you measure it, it's going faster. Now, the reason for that is that actually this is jumping between unequal sites. And the tunneling calculations are the elastic, the coherent ones are tunneling from there to there, which is a long site. It's actually jumping to a neighboring site at a slightly different energy, which is forbidden coherently. So well, actually, what's happening is the energy exchange is helping you do this. What this does then is it gives you a perfect model system for studying quantum propagation connected to a heat bath because it's very well understood that coherent part is very precisely got and enables then you can do that, which makes this something a very great topical instrument of interest. Okay, so some recent things we've done with this. Then, uh, obviously, hydrogen transport. The point is, these are model systems for the whole hydrogen economy. Every step of the hydrogen economy is kinetically limited, and that's what stops it being quite such an attractive thing as you'd hope. Yet, this is a modelling, the basic steps of that whole system. And um, then uh, we looked at other things like graphene growth, molecular electronics, alkali metals on lithium, and th uh, things like that in batteries. So it's all frightfully relevant. And I think I've just run out of time. Is that right? Two, two minutes, okay. Well, the point then is, is that in order to do all this, you have to develop a whole pile of technology. So the output of this research is not just the results and the science and the links to the fundamental stuff, but the technology you produce. And in order to do this, then, you need to work out helium sources, polarizers, detectors, and things like this, which then get exported to various other people who then produce lots of other work on things like polarizing water, so you can do NMR with very high signal efficiencies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, at surface. So it has its uses. Um, but in our case, the use that we're putting it to now, 
Um, basically, we've developed detectors. The most people, the ones you basically get, have that efficiency. We've got them up to about that, which is something of an improvement. And that then means you can do fun things like you can build a microscope using helium atoms. Uh, so a few years ago, we built one of these as a proof of principle. It was knocked up using the bits we had, had a resolution of about 5 microns as a proof of principle. We currently got a grant and are building a somewhat better one, which will have a um, 500 nanometer resolution if you just put a pinhole, which is, of course, diffraction limited. So then you stick a zone plate in, and it should give about 50 nanometers. So when you do this, if I can admit that, you get these sort of images. These are sort of technological samples that you get with it. And uh, this is our, they're more biological things. It's interesting, I was at a one-day conference yesterday, and someone said, we've got a real problem in imaging tiny wax crystals, because you put them in an electron microscope and they melt. Well, this, of course, is the perfect candidate for doing just that. And there are lots of things which are, are just destroyed by electron microscope, which would be very nice to be able to look at with this. And uh, I think I've run out of time. Thank you very much. John, thank you for that. That's a, a tour de force, actually, in 12 minutes. Um, questions for John? We've got plenty of time. Yeah. Thank you. Some very elegant experimental research. The, the, um, and the diagram you had concerning the band structure, um, I'm a chemist, but is that the band structure of hydrogen or the band structure of the substrate that it's on or the band structure of the hydrogen on the substrate? This is uh, the, the procedure is you do a DFT calculation and work out the potential between the hydrogen and the substrate. You then freeze the substrate and this is the band structure of the hydrogen in that frozen potential. It's the 3D potential. Thank you. Thank Can you... That, can, John, can, can you test the Mott theory of thermally assisted tunneling across these barriers? But it's faster than the classical tunneling diagram that you showed. Well, this is the whole point. And yes. the, 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 tr the, trouble with the trouble with the area, okay, so the area of um, quantum propagation linked to a heat bath is of immense current importance. Because uh, there are many, many topics in science where you've got some quantum propagation and it's always connected to a heat bath. The, the, the one that everyone talks about at the moment is decoherence of qubits. Okay. The problem also is that you have, if you go around, so we produced these results, and I went around the world trying to find people who would actually model these things and discuss. And what you find is there are 10 to 23 different ways of doing this. Everyone has their own pet way of doing it, and no one person can relate the way they do it to anyone else does it. And a typical reaction when you say, here's some data, was given by the expert who went out at a conference and asked him, here's the data, can you fit it? He literally turned white and took a step back. Now, the point is, you see, is that this is a very difficult field. It involves millions of approximations. No one seems to understand the approximations they've made or anyone else has made. And the point is that, well, at last we have some decent data. And the point is, all this is, you can leave it murky as long as you can't measure it. And that's what's happened, you see, is people can have 10 to the 23 different theories if you've got no data to test it. And most data isn't accurate enough to test it. But the point is, because we can look at things moving really fast, we don't have to do these 10 order of magnitude extrapolation to get the pre-exponential factor. We measure on the time scale of the pre-exponential factor. Therefore, the rates are very, very precise, and you really can show all the faults and the way where you have to put back into every theory all the things you've thrown out to make them easy. And the problem is, how do you then function? Because if you, how do you then, you then have to produce a theory which does the classic physicist thing of working out how to do it, how to simplify it, and knowing what corners you can cut. But until now, no one has been able to work that out, so everyone cuts different corners, and no one can explain what they have done or what anyone else has done, you see. So hopefully, it will focus the mind a bit on this subject. Are, are there any more? Okay, this is like the Swiss Railways, so we're back on time. <laughs> Thank you very much, John.